Okay, welcome everybody. This is the um, SAN webcast about NC SARA 2019 data reporting requirements and that we'll be discussing the enrollments and the placements. I'd like to welcome you. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network WC with WCET and uh, along with me is Dan Silverman, the assistant director for State Authorization Network with with SAN with WCET. So we will just move right along and share with you that we are going to take questions towards the end. So we have a Q&A box. So I'd like you to make sure and find the Q&A box so that you can ask questions um, that will be addressed at the end of the call. Also, this is being recorded and the recording and the transcript along with um, yeah, the recording and the transcript and the slide deck will be made a part of the SAN website. You will find that in just a few days after we get the transcripts back and we'll post it on the SAN website. So you can find under past webinars, you will find the information about today's webcast. So I'm going to turn this right away over to our presenters today. These are familiar people with us. We're really glad to have them back. Um, they talked to us about data report for us. We're really thrilled that the Associate Director for Policy Research and State Support with NC Sarah and Terry Taylor Strout, who is the CEO and Solution Architect with Ascension Consulting Group. She's a consultant with NC Sarah on this project. So we're really glad to have the both of you with us today. Thank you so much, Marianne and Terry. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to drive this and uh, tell us where you would like to go. Um, I know that uh, prior to the top of the call, um, I received uh, some links. I've put up one of them. I'm gonna put the other one up in the chat. You will find it there. So the reporting handbook is there. You find that on the um, NC Sarah website. And there's one other thing that um, I was asked to share, and I'm going to put that um, in the chat as well. I'm going to turn it over to our presenters while I go ahead and put that in the chat. So Marianne and Terry, take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Cheryl. And thank you for having us on here today. Um, it is data time, and that's the title of our presentation. It's that time of year, so we're gearing up for um, another fourth year, actually, of reporting data for NC Sarah. Uh, Terry and I are going to go over enrollment and out-of-state learning placements visually, and we'll start um, with enrollments, but let's go to the next slide. So quick agenda, the current SARA landscape, data summary of 2018, what's new and notable, then we'll go straight into enrollment reporting, and then we'll pause, take some questions, then we'll go into out-of-state learning placement reporting, uh, we've got some frequently asked questions that we'll dive into first, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. And really, even though it seems like we have quite a few slides, we really do run through these fairly quickly uh, so that we do have ample time at the end for questions and discussion. Next. So uh, just a quick overview of, of Sarah. Okay, I've got to talk about Sarah and NC Sarah for at least at least a few minutes, uh, just to remind folks of kind of where we've been and, and where we're going. We do currently have 49 states belong to Sarah, all but California. I also have three districts and territories, so Washington D.C., Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands. The big question I get is where are we with California? And actually, we're making some strides. We really are in conversations with California. Um, there's a lot more interest, a lot more um, going on. For those of you who know California politics, it's a big state. There's a lot of players and just getting everyone on the same page is tough. But we are making uh, baby steps towards that uh, end goal of hopefully getting them to be part of Sarah. So as of today, we have 1,906 institutions the reason I have this slide up of number of SARA institutions that participate is really just to show folks, uh, remind folks how fast this has all happened. In 14, we didn't have any institutions, and now today, almost 2,000. So you can see that, you know, over a really short period of time, we've grown. And with that, our enrollment, um, or I should just say our data reporting has grown too. We've gotten a lot of the bumps out of it, and we're still working on some. And, 
And that's why we like to do uh, webcasts and go to conferences and meetings so that we can get feedback from the people who do the work. The next slide. So before we jump in, let's, let's talk a little bit about why we collect data and why we think that that's important. Well, there's really a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is, is that it really is part of Sarah's mission and always has been back when they were thinking about putting this whole thing together in 2010, 11, 12, and 13. That was always part of the plan was to collect um, some data for a few reasons. One, because we are trying to balance the needs of institutions, regulators, states, and their constituents. And data reporting was required um, through state authorization in many states prior to NC Sara. So the idea was that we still would collect some data and share that with the states. But we also want to collect data to understand the impact of Sara, to see how things are going. You know, which institutions are enrolling online students? Where are those students located? These are important questions. Um, and by having this data reporting period, we can start to kind of see how that is and, and really start to understand some of the trends. Also, there's the whole idea of transparency. So we do collect this data and put it up on our website. We have it in two ways. We have a report that kind of analyzes and looks at those trends and talks about what's happening with data. But we also just have the data files up there in case you want to play around with the data uh, for either your institution or your state or even your region. Next slide. So a quick overview of what we did last year. So this is the overview of the 2018 enrollment period. Um, and I know most of you have seen these several times before, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it other than to say um, the total enrollment was just over 1.2 million. So that is, that is going up a little bit from the year before, and it's exactly on target with what we thought would happen. The only other notable thing I think about this slide is that um, there's been a little bit of shift for the independent, I'm sorry, for the private, um, for profit, independent for profit, um, a little bit decline in terms of reported enrollment and a little bit of a bump up for the public institutions. And, and I know you've all probably heard me talk about this before, but, but I think it's an important, so much so that I wanna just state it again. And that is that things are shifting in the higher education landscape. And some for profits are making the shift over to, um, uh, private nonprofit institutions. So that is going to change some of our numbers. Also, I think public institutions, although they of course joined SARA um, at, at pretty fr brisk rates, they really didn't join as briskly as the um, for-profits did. So we're still seeing public institutions in a variety of states come on board, whereas most of the in independent for-profits did that immediately. So that, that kind of explains the change in growth. Next slide. So um, a quick review of the out-of-state learning placements. First of all, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about clinical, student teaching, internships. That's really what we mean by learning placements. This was, of course, voluntary in 2018, required for this year. Um, but for the voluntary folks who did it, it was really, really helpful because it gave us a sense of what was going on. Again, this is part of our mission. We really had always thought we would collect this data. It's an important part of many academic programs and there are a lot of interest about this data from various constituents around the country. Next slide. So a quick summary of the voluntary um, reporting data that folks did for us on those out-of-state learning placements. We had 297 institutions report, which is fantastic. That represents 16% of the participating institutions. We had a total placements of just over 32,000, which is amazing. But most importantly, we got a lot of feedback. Not only did we get feedback on the web form itself in the comment section from the folks who actually did this, but we also had a working session at WCET annual meeting back in October, uh, where we really just let our hair down and talked about what worked, what didn't, and, and what things might need to have more clarity. Uh, we also had sessions with state portals and the regional directors throughout the year and kind of garnering their feedback that they had been told um, and putting that all together so that we could really think about it 
at the Data Advisory Committee meeting, which was held in December of 2018. And from that meeting, we did have some changes to, um, to the way we report and some language changes. So a big thank you, though, to the 297 institutions who did this. Without them, it would have been very difficult to get things ready for this year. So um, really can't say thank you enough. So I'll say it one more time, and then I'll move on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, next slide. So what's new and notable for this year? The first thing is the 2019 Data Reporting Handbook. So this replaces the guidebook that we had last year and actually in previous years. We had one for online enrollments and one for out-of-state learning placements. And we decided that was a little confusing. It makes a lot more sense to have one data reporting handbook with different sections in it to explain how to go about uh, collecting and reporting both online enrollment and out-of-state learning placements. Um, the, other, the other new and notable is that you will be reporting distance education enrollment from the home state. That is new, although quite a few of you have already done it. Uh, and Terry and I just strip out that, that data that you send in. But this year, we're going to keep it in there. We're asking everyone to do it so that we really can see the scope of online learning both within and without the state. I think that's a real important piece. And, and do know that we're going to tread lightly there in terms of how we report that. Uh, we will always report the out-of-state um, en enrollment numbers, just like we always do. We're not going to get rid of those. We will always have those. But we will add another area where we talk about um, home state enrollment. So this is the big year where you're going to report out-of-state learning placements. This is required for everybody. Everyone's going to do this. Uh, and just this is a, a, just a quick reminder that you do not include the home state for your out-of-state learning placements. So, and that won't change. Uh, enrollment form includes all territories. Hey, we are really excited about this one. Terry and I really worked hard on this one, believe it or not. I, it was really, I think, a little bit confusing on the web form for us to say, had a column where I think we said, just put everyone else here, or I think we might have had a few listed, but then we didn't list them all. It was a little bit uh, confusing. So this time, a lot clearer. We actually have it listed by name, and I think that's going to make a lot more sense for folks. We still want you to use the comment fields to report um, any anomalies or concerns, or to give me feedback about what's working, what's not, and why. Important information for us to have. But uh, a note of caution, this comment field is not where you put in an SOS or you say, help me here, because uh, we'll be reading those in July. Um, if you need something immediately, you're going to do something a little bit different, and Terry will talk about that. But do use this comment field to let me know how things are working and how, you know, if you have any constructive feedback, basically. I actually do read them all, so use that. Finally, the reporting window for this year is May 14th through June 4th. So three weeks, just like always, and that's the time that you will actually get those uh, uh, emails with web forms and fill it all out. Uh, I think that does it for what's new and notable. Next slide. That one goes to me. It's it good sure to see does. I'm going to okay. put myself on mute because I think it might be loud in my office. Here we go. Terry, it's all yours. Thanks, Marianne. It's, it's good to be with y'all today. So uh, again, just some general guidelines about the um, enrollment reporting. Um, we're gonna report, you're gonna report as you do to iPads um, and using the iPads definitions, which are all, um, there are links to all of that in the handbook. Um, the link, the first link that Cheryl put in the chat is actually a direct link to that handbook for this year and everybody should have received that um, via email as well. Um, and so this is, you know, I know San has been talking um, to membership for a very long time about get out, out of your office and go meet the people that do other work on the campus. And this is the year where that work will bear fruit because um, in, in reporting the out-of-state learning placements, um, it'll be very helpful to have, uh, you know, colleagues in each of those departments that make those placements as well as um, the uh, the institutional research person um, who does the iPads reporting. So um, basically the fall, the enrollment reporting is just as it has been for the past years. 
Um, and so we just are asking people to use their best judgment. If you don't report to IPEDS, read up on what the IPEDS reporting is and try to model that. And, and most importantly, be consistent um, within your own institution from year to year so that your data um, is consistent as time goes on. Next slide, please. So uh, the way this will work this year is um, everyone who is on the NC Sarah contact list will receive an email. And at that point, um, when you click the link in that email, it's going to open two tabs. Next slide, please. And we actually can show you a picture of it. So when you click that link, it's going to look like this. You'll see there's a tab for enrollment and then there's a tab for out of state placement. So it'll be very easy for you to coordinate internally who's going to fill out each of those forms and you can everything is saved as you're going along and doing your work. So people can have at it on either one of those tabs. Um, you know, make sure you coordinate so that you're not overriding each other. But I, I think that this data entry will be a little bit easier than it has been in past years. Okay, next slide. Um, when you come into that, um, each of those tabs, there's a bit of um, verbiage there that again explains what you're required to report. And so do read that. That's additional instructions. It, at this point, it's all consistent with what's in the handbook, but I just wanted people to be able to kind of see ahead of time what they're going to see when they get that data link. Next slide, please. Okay, so some, some improvements to the actual forms. Um, the enrollment reporting form is one long form as it has been, um, but for purposes of creating slides, we've broken it into sections. Um, people asked over the, the last three years that I've been involved in this reporting um, to have enrollment totals because my sense is in, in reading the comments, people are really trying hard to make sure that they're reporting accurately and that and they're trying to match that back to their iPads reporting. So as you complete this form, um, as you enter data into each of the states, it's actually going to give you a total there at the top of the form. And that's very good. And then you'll also note the asterisks um, will be next to the home state of the institution. And again, remember, you are reporting that home state uh, enrollment data for distance education enrollment this time. Okay, next slide. And then this is the improvement that Mary Ann talked about. Um, non sara states and territories are listed. So um, each of the territories is actually listed. There's no longer an other territories um, category. And again, as in the uh, sara states and territories, the enrollment is, uh, is summed as you enter the data in those fields. So th this was, there was one question that came up a couple of weeks ago um, when we did this presentation, and that is people were confused about what they're reporting. So we just want to be very clear, the enrollment is the fall IPEDS enrollment reporting. So we know it's not a full year, but IPEDS reporting only counts distance education in the fall reporting, and that's the reason for that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the comments field looks like just like it did before. You can click the little button there on the bottom right to make it bigger. Um, again, don't put in information, you know, where you need a response back right away. For that, you're going to want to email the data at email address. Um, also, please don't update your contact information here. You want to do that through um, your um, compact. Okay, next slide. Finally, um, there's some Im improvements to the confirmation and authorization um, section. Uh, the name and email address are required, as is the sector, and then you also need to um, answer the question about, there's a new question about whether or not your reporting includes branch campus activity. So you would say yes or no, and then you need to click the little box next to I agree, and there's a link there to the new 2019 data sharing agreement. So this is pretty much the same. Uh, the, the one addition here is that we've at, actually asked you to enter your iPads ID number. And this is just uh, so that we do have clarity about whether institutions that are part of systems, whether they're reporting for a campus or for the system. So just to make sure that we know what data we're looking at, that's an improvement there. 
Okay, the next slide, please, Cheryl. So at this point, I'd like to see if there are any questions that are specific to enrollment before we move on to out-of-state learning placement. I think people are pretty comfortable with this. There are, there are just a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so the first one is, do they need to report international students? Well, they do not need to report international students because uh, NCSERA is a national organization. So, um, and, and there is confusion about that. I think because people aren't, you know, the territories are US, but international students are not. International students who are physically in the US studying, they would report that, correct, Marianne? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. You are correct. So this is a follow-up to that. Um, if you all could put the question, some people are putting it in chat. Can you see the Q&A? That was where our questions need to go, please. Um, but a follow-up to the international um, is from somebody who put it in the chat box. They indicated about the AE and APO. Um, would they write those numbers in the comment section? Oh, this is a very good question. So they're talking about the military? Yes. Addresses. So this is where, um, NC Sarah is different than IPEDS. We are asking you to report military students where they are actually taking the activity or where the learning is taking place. And that is different than IPEDS. We have a section in the handbook that kind of goes down into the weeds about that um, this year. So that's, I think that's helpful for folks to look at that. Um, but the answer to that is we really want you, if you can, let us know where military students are actually taking the activity. Okay, uh, we have a handful more. Um, will we ever be able to upload this data as opposed to manually typing it in? Well, I don't know because I think the problem is that currently you need to uh, disaggregate it by state. And that's not how you report it to iPads. So it's not like it's a file that you could just upload from iPads. Uh, but if you're asking more about down the road, could we maybe have some sort of upload function? That's obviously a possibility. We're always trying to make this a little bit better each year. Um, and again, that might be a nice thing to put in the comment box for us so that you know if we see a whole bunch of people saying that would be a good idea, then we can, you know. Kind of put our thinking caps on and try and figure out how to make that that work on our end um you know with technology i wouldn't be at all surprised if that's something we could do in the next few years uh, i i too like the upload function when i'm doing doing different things so i can understand that that might be something we'd want to look at good good comment and uh, you use the term sector there people are wondering oh. if you could define that please yes Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was going to do that. <laughs> um, so when I'm talking about sectors or when Terry's talking about sectors, we're really just trying to trying to get a handle on um, higher education sectors. So we're talking about uh, are you a private for profit, a private not for profit, a public institution? Those are the sectors we're talking about. Great. Um, and somebody asked just for clarification purposes, both the enrollment and the placement um, report is due at the same time? It is, and that's a good question too. Yeah, that's why we decided to just have one handbook, one reporting window, and even one email um, to kind of drive that point home. But it's a really good question because um, they're, they are reporting on different time frames. So that does get a little bit confusing, but yes, you'll report on both of those data points in the window. And then we have, could you please define branch campus? This institution um, or the, has five campuses. She wants to know if those are, or he wants to know if those are branch campuses. And you know what, branch campus is tricky. So that person might wanna just send me an email uh, because some are branch campuses, some are not. It really depends on how it's defined uh, with your Title IV, with your iPads number, and even through us. So if you're, uh, if you're having issues with that, just send me an email and we can, we can talk offline. Okay. 
Uh, then uh, the confirmation and authorization is by the person filling out the form? It is. Signing? Okay. Um, the next question, what about international students who are living here but taking distance education? Right. Good question. They're located and, in the States. Right. Good question. I think Terry, Terry touched on that a little bit. So if you, if you have international students here in the States taking either state learning placements or doing online learning, we do want you to report on that. Um, there is a placement question. I'm going to hold on to that after the placements. Um, does each form enable you to save and go back into it before the confirmation page? Terry, you want to take that one? I will, yes. I've just been testing them and it absolutely does save. There's an, and I, you can't see all of the next buttons and the previous buttons because the screen's so wide that the screenshot wouldn't have been legible but the navigation is very straightforward in this year's forms. Okay. Um, this one, do you know if we need to disaggregate students in non sara US territories that this person has received a report from her reporting group that just lists US dependencies, parentheses islands, and need to know if they need to request more detail to separate perhaps the like Pacific Islands? I would like that, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I would like it to be by by um, the territories. Okay. If you can't do it, if you can't find it this year, work hard on making that happen for next year and put that in the comment field for me. And then the last question before we move into um, placements. Uh, if you submit enrollment first, she understands you can submit either survey separately of one another. How does this process work to see the out-of-state learning placement? Will one tab be darkened out? I don't know that there's a visual, um, rep, you know, I don't know that there's a visual reference, but you'll be able to see that you can't resubmit the data. And I'll, there's kind of a lock and submit, and, and that's in the screenshot that we'll be showing very shortly. Super. So I think it's it's a matter of coordination, Cheryl, I think more than it has been just because you're doing two really different things. And so um, I do feel that the each of those tabs will function very independently. Um, and so, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, kind of having a game plan, which is why it's really good to have these conversations ahead of time so that you have time to plan your game plan. Great. Okay, one little question popped in here that maybe we should go ahead and, I, and uh, address right now. Is data by location of the activity or reported residency? Location of the activity. Great. All right, let's move on to out-of-state learning placements. Great, so that's still me. And again, um, Marianne has discussed this, and I know we've been talking about it for a few years now. Um, but out-of-state learning placements, um, examples are clinical rotations, student teaching and internships. They're most often in health-related disciplines and education. Um, and we have a, a slide coming up that's the specific criterion. There's also a very clear section in the handbook that addresses this. So um, don't try, you know, there are, I think that it's a pretty straightforward and, and Marianne can get into any of the um, examples that are a little tricky, we've, we've got that laid out for you in the next slide. So we're using CIP codes um, because CIP codes, are, you know, are the scheme that, that most institutions are using to report. Um, we're using the 2010 um, CIP codes, but just the, the 47 two di digit, the highest level um, for each of the program areas. And again, we'll, if you go to the next slide, it shows a list of those um, and in the handbook in the appendix is um, the full list of all 47 that's linkable. And so basically the idea here is to not have to figure out what these are. Each of your programs should already be associated with the CIP code and they're very broad category. So, I, you know, it's, it's not a trick question. Um, it really is just using the information that we already have. Okay, let's go to the next slide if we would. 
And then where are these numbers kept? So this is back to the point about, um, you know, making sure that you, um, you know, have friends in institutional research. They certainly are doing all the IPEDS reporting. And then uh, to the extent that you haven't had to report this kind of data in the past, um, you're gonna need to actually go into the academic departments that have these learning placements and ask them to collect that data and report it and set up a system so that you can do that on a consistent way each year. If you go to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna toss this one back to Mary Ann to really talk through um, the criteria. Thanks, Terry. Uh, so this criteria uh, has been modified, modified a little bit from last year based on all those comments and discussions that we had around the country with um, folks who actually deal with, with the data. So um, you'll notice a few changes from last year when this, this is voluntary. Uh, number one does not change though. The placement is outside the home state of the SARE institution. Number two, the placement involves the physical presence of the student at the out of state location. Number three is a little bit different than last year. So this is the placement is an activity required for degree completion or professional licensure. What you'll notice for those folks who did this last year is that we got rid of the term formal agreement. Honestly, we thought having formal agreement in there made it clearer and cleaner and better all the way around. And boy, were we wrong. Um, <laughs> we got lots of comments and, and, uh, and feedback that that actually made it really complicated for folks at the institution level. So uh, after we heard back from a whole bunch of folks and talked to our data committee, we agreed with everyone and we just took that piece out. I actually think number three still needs some work. I'm gonna be honest. Um, you know, when we were working on this in December and January, we thought we had it, but I have to tell you, I think number three needs a little bit more tweaking. Um, and so I'm waiting to see how the feedback comes back this year. But number four, this is a little bit of a tweak as well. The placement is offered for credit and or offered for a fee. And finally, the placement started between January 1 and December 31st of 2018. So a little bit of change, a little bit of clarity. Uh, I do want input though, as you guys go through this, uh, feel free to send me a comment about how these work for you and tell me why. Uh, and give me some suggestions. I really do, do take those to heart. I really do read them all. And as you can see, it really does work because last year we got so much feedback about formal agreement, we took that piece out. All right, next slide. I'm gonna run through just a couple examples. Uh, so the first here is three University of Texas at El Paso nursing students each do a single clinical rotation at each of two hospitals in New Mexico and one rotation at a hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. So UTEP would report three placements in New Mexico and three placements in Arizona, all under SIP code 51. The reason for this is because if it's in the same state, you don't report it. So that's how example one goes through. There'll probably be questions about this at the end and we'll, we'll flip back to this if we need to. Um, but for now, let's move to example number two. So this is a student at University of Colorado, Denver, UCD and they participated in an out-of-state learning placement in spring of 2018 under SIP code 13 in Arkansas. The same student then participated in another OSLP in fall 2018 under SIP code 46. So does UCD report two placements, one in each state? So yes, if both learning placements were in the same state, both placements would be reported one under each SIP code. The reason for that is because it's a different SIP code. So that's the difference there. And also this is kind of an interesting example because the student did one in spring and one in fall in the same year. So you would be reporting that student twice in that case. Um, I, again, we might have some questions about this and don't worry, we can always flip back to this at the end and, and take questions on it if that's not clear. But for now, we'll, we'll go to the next slide. And this okay. goes back to you, Terry. So that's me. Um, and so now just to frame where we are, um, we're back to a screenshot of when you first open up that link um, and you click now into out-of-state learning placements, the out-of-state placement tab. 
Uh, this is, is, I know it's not legible, but I did want to prove that there are previous and next buttons on every single screen. You can just see they're really, you know, kind of far out to the edge. So next slide. Okay, this, um, so the CIP code recording or the learning placement reporting really hasn't changed very much in terms of the data entry form. Um, it really is a sort of an expanding form. So when you first come into this form, uh, you will see just um, one of these, and then you'll use the pull downs to um, write in which the SIP code, what SIP code it is, what state it is, and enter the enrollment. So this is why you really need to have this prepared ahead of time. Um, and I believe that Cheryl put in the chat um, at the top of the hour a link into the data reporting page for NC Sarah. And um, there's actually a link under 2019 directly to uh, download an Excel spreadsheet that's been updated that includes all those territories. So it has all of the Sarah states, district and territories in one section and then a break and then it has all the non Sarah um, in another. And so you'll really want to have that spreadsheet populated so that you can just kind of sit down and start filling out the form and some of them will be quite long. In order to um, add another one, you just use the um, add another CIP state enrollment at the bottom. You'll also see there's a very prominent save button. So you can say, you know, save as much as you want as you go along. It's not going anywhere. It's just being saved until you um, are ready to submit. So go to the next slide, if you would, please. Um, again, the comments field looks just the same. It's an expandable box um, and use it to explain any difficulties that you're having. Um, I will say when I do the data analysis each summer, I really do go into those comment fields. So if, if you're struggling with, um, you know, trying to make, well, in this case, it wouldn't match to iPads, but if, you know, any challenges that you're having, do report those because we really do read them and we categorize them and um, take those challenges back to the data committee to um, develop a plan to improve the web forms for the following year and to improve the policies for the following year. So people really are listening to those comments, do make them. Okay, and the next one. Uh, again, the confirmation and authorization looks very much like the prior one but it is a separate form. So you can submit one and then work on the other one, not a problem. Again, um, we are asking you to report your um, IPEDS institution number. If you do not have one because you do not report to IPEDS, that's not a, a problem at all. You'll see that those are not required fields. So you can just leave it blank and your form will submit just fine. You'll see the, um, the navigation at the bottom here is save and return. So even if you know you, you thought you were ready, you can save it, go back and look at the whole thing. Then when you push save, submit, and lock data, that's really when you're submitting. If perchance you, um, you know, realize that you've made a mistake after you've done that, you need to reach out to NC Sarah with the data at email um, because that would need to be locked on the back end. So don't, don't trigger save, submit, and lock until you, you're really ready to submit because that really is the last step in the process. Okay, next slide, please. So I just want to cover some of these FAQs um, so that we can really focus on the detailed questions that people might have. Um, again, what if you don't submit to, to iPads for enrollment? Report as if you do um, and, and do attempt to use their definitions if that's troublesome. Please report that it is troublesome. I do count the, um, the proportion of comments that have to do with iPads confusion each year. Um, how do you report military students? We talked about this in the context of enrollment before. You're gonna report them where they're taking the course, a so physical location of the activity. And then um, the hopeful question, um, would, would Department of Ed delays change or affect the annual data collection? categorically no, this is really happening in May and June. And um, that's why we're trying to make sure everybody has good information to prepare for that. And then the last one, um, you're gonna use the IPEDS definition for distance education, which again is highlighted in the handbook. 
So with those sort of big questions answered, um, let's see what other questions participants have, please. Great, thank you so much, Terry and Marianne. Um, we do have a number of questions if people have put in the Q&A section. Um, we'll start with, uh, the first question is about uh, a law school program. And uh, evidently at this institution, they have internships that are not required to graduate, but students who will be practicing in another state sometimes do out of state externships because they need the experience before taking the bar in that state. So, um, they're wondering if this is if this qualifies under this as well. Um, this is the only program where it seems borderline mandatory or not. It's not a mandatory um, necessarily um, for the externships to occur, but they are occurring and are beneficial. So does this apply to the out of state learning placement? So this this is a good question. Very good question, because I think this is where my number three um, criteria was just a little bit of a sticky wicket. Um, so if I'm hearing this right, it is not required. They don't have to do it, um, but it's beneficial if they do. The next question I would ask is if they have to pay any fees for it or if they get any credit for it. If they don't, if they're not getting any credit for it and they're not paying for it, this is just something that they're doing to kind of help their career, then you would not count it. We have this question actually down um, already as something that we should probably discuss at our data um, advisory committee meeting. And these kind, of, these kind of questions are actually very helpful. I actually wrote that down um, to, to kind of add to my box of questions to take back. But my advice for this year is that if it's not getting any credit, you're not paying any fee and it's not required, don't count it. Okay. Uh, the next question has to do with what you all plan to do looking forward. So this question is, mm -hmm. will the criteria for inclusion be the same next year as this year? And the reason this is being asked is because when they're working with the departments at their institution, um, they start contacting departments in January to start the process of gathering learning placement information because it takes them a while to respond. So I think this person is trying to be proactive and trying to get the right information for the institution. Um, oh, absolutely. Question. Absolutely. This is such a good question. And I wish I had a better answer. Um, as you all know, we took out formal agreements in February. So that's when you guys knew that we weren't going to use formal agreements. And I had several institutions call me and say, oh my goodness, it's too late. That's the criteria that we put in place for this year. We've already got it done. I've, I've got my numbers. I'm ready to rock and roll. And, and my answer then is to say, that's okay. You report what you have in good faith and write me a note in the comment section that says that's what you did. And make a note to yourself that that's what you did. We understand that this is hard. We also understand that changing, changing some of it around in you know, February and you're gonna report in May on something that happened last year is tough. We totally get that. Um, but we're learning too, and we're new at this, and we're all trying to do this together and do a good job. Um, and so I just say my, I guess what I'm going to say is, hang on, be patient. As you can see, we had less changes this year than the year before. And next year, I anticipate even less. Eventually, just like the enrollment data, we get to a place where it's pretty much set. It's in, it's in a good place. Um, and we're going to get there with these out-of-state learning placements. But no one collects this. Um, publicly anyway. I know that you had to report some of this for your state authorization requirements to certain states, but that was a little bit different because you just sent it to the state and they held on to it. This is the only place really in the country that we're asking to do this. And so we're learning together. Uh, so again, I would say send me a note or put a note in that comment section about what you did and why. Um, and we understand that it's hard and that we're just moving forward in good faith together. Great. Uh, this one is, uh, are you looking for the SIP code of the course or the SIP code the student is majoring in? That's a very good question. Um, I don't know why I'm blanking, but I am. So I'm going to have to check that and get back to you. <laughs> I believe it's the SIP code of the course, Marianne. Thank you, Terry. I think it is too, but all of a sudden I blanked. <laughs> Completely. 
that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. See, uh, stump, stump the presenter. Good job. <laughs> well, like you, this is the first year of the of the required uh, <laughs> enrollment uh, required placement, so it makes sense that you know so there's some kinks getting kicked out there. So anyway, yeah. all right. So moving into the next question. Um, so this is we've been talking about this a little bit in terms of which internship internships, and you're you were talking about your number three there, Marianne. Yeah. Um, and this question is, if they have a distance, a distance ed student not in the institution's home state completing an in-person in internship and receiving credit, would they need to report it to um, report them as out-of-state learning placement? Yes, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you would. Um, you know, I know, I know it's kind of tough with the um, some of the different types of out-of-state learning placements. And and Cheryl, if I may, maybe I'll just talk for a minute about that. And that might be preemptive on some questions that are going to going to probably come down the pike. There was last year some confusion about what to do about uh, third-party um, internship placement. This was tough last year, and we told people not to report them. Uh, because the question kind of came up late in the game. But after we did our due diligence and did some research and talked to a whole bunch of states and actually even talked to some of the third party uh, placement uh, companies, it became clear that we do need folks to report those. So these are things that, um, that happen particularly in psychology, believe it or not, but for PsyD, uh, Doctorate of Psychology programs are very, very popular. And what happens is they use a service to do the placement and that happens very quickly. So, you know, the students fill out all the information and then the turnaround time is only three or four weeks and they need to be in Wisconsin or Maryland or wherever. Um, so this year we are asking people to report those uh, because the, the reason for that is that at the end of the day, the institution is still responsible for the internship and for the learning and for the final degree that takes place and that falls under that. So most of the folks that I've talked to at the big institutions that have a lot of this are very comfortable with reporting those and there's just, it's not a problem, but I wanted to point that out because that is a change from last year. So third party um, placement services do need to be reported. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, is there an option to print the report after completing and it's locked? Well, um, I, there's not like a pull down that says print, but you know, you can screenshot if you like. I, I also believe that, um, I believe that in enrollment, if you have prior year data, you can see that in, when you log in to, with your unique uh, information. So, you know, I've been looking at a sandbox. I don't have prior year data. Um, but you know, you certainly can, and I could see wanting to do that with the CIP code one. Yep. Um, and you, you, you know, you can. might be able yeah, to right click and print. I, I just haven't, you know, I haven't really played around with it too much, but there's got to be a creative solution to that. But, but Terry is absolutely right that if you have um, old data, you can actually look at it um, for the enrollment piece. That's not true in the out of state learning placement for those 297 who volunteered. Uh, it will be going forward. Um, and you're right, the print option, that's interesting. I, I just wrote that down as a note to myself to, to see if we can think about that for next year. But Terry's right, there's some, there's some workarounds for it for this year. Good question. Okay. Um, Cheryl, I would also, just while we're talking about the, the people who piloted this last year, the institutions, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're, if you're really still sort of saying, I'm not sure how I'm gonna put my head around this, um, I would encourage people to go back to the out-of-state learning placement report that was published last September. And at the back of that report, um, we actually list all 297 institutions that did do this voluntarily last year. And part of that was to say thank you and highlight them, but part of it was also so that all the institutions could look at that and maybe find, you know, oh, I know somebody at that institution or that's an institution that's has similar challenges to mine so that they can reach out, um, you know, and, and talk to people who have gone before them. So I would encourage people to do that. Good. 
Okay, we have, um, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but I just want to advise everybody, we've got a pretty good number of questions left and do not be concerned because these questions are banked and we'll talk with Terry and Marianne about getting your questions answered after if we run out of time. Um, but I'll just move right, right along to the next one. Um, just want to verify one more time that they will report the out-of-state learning placement only once if the combination of student plus SIP plus state is unique within the year time frame. So uh, its example was if it's the same in two terms, is it reported only once? So the student is same student, same SIP code, same state, but in two different terms, it's reported only once? That's true. And then the other example was the same student, same zip code, same state in same term, but two different sites, but in the same state, it is also only reported once. It is, it is. And this is, and I would love some feedback from folks on this, um, this year around in that comment section, because really our data advisory committee was split down the middle about whether or not we should count the person twice if they did an internship in the same state, two different places, same SIP. And it really was, we were just right in the middle about whether we should or should not. So some feedback on that would be, would be helpful because I've heard from a few institutions that have told me it's actually really hard to pull those out. And I've heard from other institutions who told me it's, it's, that makes it easier for them. So, um, I have a feeling this is going to be split down the middle for institutions as well, but your feedback would be welcome on that so we can, you know, either stay the course that we're doing now and saying, hey, you just report them once, or if we're going to make a change for next year. Great. Um, this is a question that actually, Marianne, this next question has to do with interactions with California, and I think it's a good question, <laughs> and I don't want to dismiss it. It's just that it will get us off of um, talking about enrollment. So I thank Katie very much for submitting the question, but I want to address this um, at a different time with Marianne and Terry and get that response back to Katie um, okay. about that. Um, okay, so the next question, if for some reason they are unable to get all of the data submitted by the June 4th deadline, what should they do? Do the best you can. Submit something. So just do the best you can and write me a note in that comment box about what went wrong or what isn't in there or, or what's happening. We understand that this is the first year we're asking for this. I have a feeling my data is going to be all over the place. Um, it's, as I like to say, squishy. And that's okay for the first year. That's to be expected. We're all learning together how this is working. So um, again, move forward in good faith and do the best you can. This question follows right along with that, Terry. Uh, I mean, um, Mary Ann, it's from uh, our friend Terry, uh, who asks um, that she understands and accepts the need for the learning placement request. Her concern is how you will use the data. The reason mm. she says this is the only way to gather this information at many institutions is go department by department, college by college, and request mm -hmm. the information. With this kind of reporting, uh, she's expecting to see a big margin for error. Yeah, she'd be right. <laughs> but I think what this is starting is a process and a culture at an institution to be able to gather this information. So I think if I understand you correctly, Marianne, you're, you're indicating that, yes, it is a uh, margin for error initially, but this will become part of commonplace um, management of, um, of placements for the future. Exactly, exactly. And Cheryl, you and I talk about this a lot when we're, we're on the road and presenting that, um, you know, we know the institutions are moving toward this, moving towards having a better handle on uh, where their students are and where learning is taking place and where out-of-state learning placements are happening. And, you know, most institutions are in that process and each year it gets a little bit better and we understand that. So um, Cheryl's absolutely right. We, we, we really are doing this because we, we made a commitment as part of our mission to really look at this data. Um, and that's what we're doing. And we figured we just have to just start. I know there was some, some um, uh, discussion, I guess I'll say, from institutions that said, gosh, could we just have another year of it being voluntary? Or could we, you know, maybe report, but don't put, but don't put all the numbers in or something. 
And we really thought about that, actually. We really did, because we know this is tough and this is hard. And, and, and as the other, other uh, comment that came over earlier was that, you know, we did change the requirements a little bit from year to year. But in the end of the day, we thought, you know what, we have to just start somewhere. So this is where we're starting. We know the data is going to be squishy. We get that. But every year, I think it's going to get better, just like the enrollment data did. You know, the first year we did that was kind of tricky and touch and go as well. But now I think we've got some really robust data in there that makes super good sense and that we can really hang our hat on. And I know we're going to get there for the out-of-state learning placement data reporting as well. I know it. It is going to take a few years, and that's okay. Thank you. Uh, we are going back to a little bit to the um, enrollments. They have, this institution has 624 students who took all their degree requirements online in fall 2018. However, only 64 declared as distance learner. Do they report the six, on the 624 or the 64? Carrie, do you want to talk a little bit about iPads and how to do that? Um, yeah. Can, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. I don't think it matters if they're declared as distance learners. So that sounds like it's their definition. Right. The question is, um, you know, if the students meet the iPads definition for distance education courses, which is exclusively online, but then they define it and it takes a paragraph to explain it, um, <laughs> then you count them. So I would be inclined to count the, the bigger number, not just the small one, because um, it, the smaller that that is not an iPads definition. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, is there a maximum num character limit in the comment section. Not that I'm aware of I, you know, kind of randomly typed and it kept scrolling. I've seen pretty long comments and that comments field has been in the form since I've been working on it. So that this is a third year. Um, you know, if you really need if it's pages and pages, maybe send an email. Um, just because it, you know, kind of messes up the spreadsheet. But again, you know, or briefly say what it is and then maybe send more detail. But I've had, I've read comment fields that take up a half sheet of paper in an Excel cell on the spreadsheet. Okay, yeah. great. Um, okay, so we're only going to, we're going to take just a couple more and then we're going to have to um, have just final comments from Marianne and Terry. So let me ask this question. Uh, the institution offers a Master's of Arts in teaching programs that are also alternative certification programs. We require the student to be employed by a school district in a teaching or teaching resident position as a condition of enrollment, but they do not provide academic credit for the employment. Would this be considered an out-of-state learning placement? You know what, I might need a little bit more detail on that. And so I can do, I can do that one offline. Okay. And uh, she asked a another question in that regard that, um, does Sarah want institutions to report on out-of-state learning placements that are part of on-ground programs that are authorized by the state operating outside of ah, Sarah? We do. Yes, good, good question. I should have said that earlier. We do actually. Okay, so I have time for one more quick question and then, then I promise that the other questions uh, we will handle offline. Um, do, weren't the out-of-state learning placements data in the 2018 pilot reported by the total number of placements? Because now you're talking about um, the, um, in the state, they've already been counted, so you count them only once. Um, so I guess they're referring back to that. And is there a contrast there? I actually think that uh, maybe I, I'm hearing this wrong, but I think that might be a question about um, our final report and how we did that, because I know there's there's a little bit of anxiety about how we're going to report this down the road. It will look a lot like the enrollment reporting with an institution listed and then states across the side and in and numbers in, in the columns, but we can't I'm hesitant to do that this year. Um, because the data is squishy. So, um, you know, I'm not looking to do that this year. Down the road, we might do that. The other problem with that is just technology. If you can imagine 2,000 institutions with all of those data points, I mean, it's millions of, of data points. So that's going to be hard to get our head around about how to, how to make that useful for people. I don't want to just do a data dump. That doesn't make any good sense. 
So uh, for the reporting this year, we will report aggregate numbers in terms of the different SIP codes, because I think that does make sense and that is something that's useful to look at. And of course, we'll look at the big number as well. So um, if you're worried about it, I can, I can ease your anxiety and tell you that look at last year's report, it's gonna look a lot like that. Okay. Uh, well, I, you know, we are at the top of the hour, so I, I just, we could go on probably for another hour, I'm sure, with questions. <laughs> so uh, please know that uh, the slide deck will be posted, and on that you will see Marianne and Terry's contact information. You can also find that on the NC Sarah website. Um, I just want to run through just very briefly. There is a, a SAN Advanced Topics Workshop um, coming up in October, the registration is open, and the annual meeting for WCET will be in early November in Denver. Um, we want to thank, uh, well, the webinar, and as I said, will be found in past webinars, and we want to thank our supporting members for their commitment to WCET and e-learning, and of course, our annual sponsors for WCET. So we thank them, and we're very grateful to Marianne and Terry for coming back again and speaking directly to our SAN members. We're, that, that, we really appreciate that a lot. Um, and so you've, you've been very gracious to spend time with us in this way. And I will communicate with both of you all about the, the questions that remain. So thank you all for being on today. And uh, thank you for letting me go a minute over. And I uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Cheryl. Bye-bye, everyone.